Well, I love coming to the seminary, and the reason is primarily because I believe so strongly in what you're doing. And by what you're doing, I believe strongly in what the faculty is doing, but I really am here because I believe strongly in what you men are doing. You're investing your lives in something that is going to change your life and your ministry until you go home with the Lord. I am so grateful for the training that I received. I'm so grateful uh, for the study in Greek, in Hebrew, in the languages. Uh, I continue to use them to this very day. And uh, uh, it's valuable, and uh, your ministry will be deepened, and God will uh, mold you during these years in seminary. And so I'm here because of you. I'm here to support you and encourage you. Um, I know that seminary, there's a battle with time management pressures and financial worries and deadlines and fears and insecurities and a continual sense of becoming overwhelmed by the events that surround you. But uh, never far from your mind, I know, because it was in my mind, am I going to make it? In fact, I had a little twinge hit when I heard it's coming up, Thanksgiving's coming up. I went, oh, am I going to get those papers done? <laughs> Wait, that was like 30 years ago. Uh, <laughs> so... You know what it means. Thanksgiving, everyone's eating turkey, watching football, and you're worrying about your collateral reading. You're worrying, are you going to get everything done? Am I going to make it? And it's, it's almost enough to make you neglect giving careful attention to one of the most important battles I'm going to be talking to you about today, and that is the battle with your own flesh. That complex of sinful passions which remains as a remnant of the old man, and will remain until you receive your glorified body. I've dealt with too many pastors who failed this test. Uh, we have uh, 2,000 churches and pastors I deal with here in the U.S., and then we are in uh, 23 countries, and uh, I don't know how many thousands more overseas. But uh, I've dealt with too many who forfeited their ministry on the altar of sexual gratification. There's one, uh, one of our churches in the town of 300 town of 300, the church is 300. Imagine that. The town, the same size as the church. Two pastors on a Wednesday, on a Thursday, no pastors, because the senior pastor was exposed in an adulterous relationship with the associate pastor's wife. And so they called me on that Thursday. I made arrangements to go over to see them on Sunday. I preached the sermon, and then I met uh, with the uh, elders and deacons. It was it was really it really had a big impact on me. Not for what you're what you're thinking. I assumed I would see hysterical people, devastated people, weeping people, angry people. I wasn't sure what I was going to in, uh, expect, but uh, when I got there, I saw 300 people. They were they were looking like you are right now. They were earnest, sincere, serious. They recognized they were in a tough spot, but they weren't. it wasn't like I thought I was going to en encounter. That was striking. And then afterwards, I met with the uh, elders and deacons. There were 10 of them in the room. And they were even more so, more composed. They're just very godly men. I, I, I made comment about that, and then I just said, was your pastor a... I, I never heard him preach. I just hung out with him in our fellowship meetings. Uh, was your pastor a good... Is he a good preacher? They said, oh, he's the best. One guy said, he's a Bible scholar. And uh, I, I, I then started realizing this man taught the Bible faithfully and well for years. And the people embraced the Bible, obeyed the Word of God. The leaders embraced the Word of God, founded their own lives on that. But that man did not. He was just going through the motions, just teaching. I was reminded of another man in our fellowship. Um, I went to his ordination uh, examination. And uh, I remember, I, I do that, I probably get on a couple of those every year. And I went to his ordination exam, and he did the best job of anyone I ever saw. Whatever was asked, he had a series of answers that he was just so methodical and specific, concise, specific, lengthy uh, answers, and it was impressive. Four hours of that. Fast forward a few years later, 
And I was called in because uh, he was caught in an adulterous affair with a woman that he met on the internet. They met in, uh, he, he was in one city, she was in another. They met in between in a, in a hotel. So I went down to see him, talk to him. And uh, he told me about how he met her and on, online and, you know, all of that. And then I said, you know, you were the best I ever saw in an ordination exam. And he kind of went, yeah, you know, it's kind of funny because uh, I'd already had sex with her twice. Did you hear what I said? That guy at his ordination exam gave the best accounting of anyone I ever saw for four straight hours. He'd had sex with that other woman two times already by the time the ordination exam came about. And so uh, um, I've dealt with too many pastors, gone through that. Some of them sat where you sit today. They sat here. And uh, I want to issue as strong a reminder as I possibly can that your ongoing battle with the flesh is one of your top priorities as a man of God. And so we have uh, some handouts we're going to hand out to you now, so I'd like the ushers to hand them out. And uh, um, to help us remember what we're going to be talking about, we're going to study David's great sin in 2 Samuel 11 through 19. Now, I'm not going to do an exposition of David's adultery and sinful cover-up in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. In fact, that was one of the most memorable messages I ever heard at uh, Grace Theological Seminary in my day. I don't know if you were there, Dr. Mayhew. I know both you and Dr. Boosness had Dr. Davis. And Dr. John Davis spoke in our chapel on David's sin, and he just stayed in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. I never forgot that sermon. Never forgot that sermon. But uh, this is going to be an overview of uh, 2 Samuel 11 through 19 and the effects of David's sin. So if you've got uh, your uh, handouts, send them out to the aisle outside to the ushers, and then they'll make sure that the rest of the guys get theirs. So uh, if you don't have a, a handout by now, raise your hand. And one of the ushers will be sure and get it to you. Anyone? Okay, they'll be sure to get you some. So thank you, men, for handing those out. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel 11. In 2 Samuel 11, we read the account of David's sin of lust in verse 2, adultery in verse 4, and David's attempted cover-up by the means of deceitful manipulation, verses 6 through 13. Let's read in 2 Samuel 11, just the first couple of verses. Then it happened in the spring, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Ravah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed, walked around on the roof of the king's house. It's cooler up there. That's where he's walking. From the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. There's the lust. The sin of lust begins. Not the first look, but the long second look. So David sent and inquired about the woman. One said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. The woman conceived and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. It's interesting, those are the only words Bathsheba ever says in this whole account, I'm pregnant. And uh, so we see it begins, the effects of David's sin. He had this uh, sinful cover-up, deceitful manipulation. And then when that didn't work, he arranged for the death of Uriah, verses 14 through 25. And this frighteningly tragic tale is told in sordid detail and with painful, brutal honesty. But even more painful is to study carefully the effects of David's sin upon himself and upon others. And for about six months I've been thinking about this, just looking at these passages. And uh, it's striking to me to see the wide range of the effects of David's sin. First off, the effects of David's sin upon himself. David uh, first off received a harsh 
and shocking rebuke from Nathan the prophet. Let's read that in chapter 12. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb, prepared it for the lamb, man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man. How hypocritical. His anger burned greatly, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who's done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold. Remember that, fourfold. Because he did this thing and had no compassion. Nathan then said to David, You are the man. You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel. It is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You've taken his wife to be your, your wife. have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now therefore the son, the sword shall never Never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion. He will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. That is a shocking, harsh rebuke. And David had to receive that. And to his credit, in verse 13, he responded with repentance. And so the first effect of David's sin upon himself was he had to receive these shocking words. I never want to hear those words spoken to me by anyone. I never want to be the recipient of those kinds of words. That is sad enough. But the effects of David's sin continue. He brought, number two, terrible heartache upon himself and his family members, as prophesied by Nathan. Nathan told him that in verse 10. And then we see in uh, uh, verses uh, 15 through 19, the newborn infant son did die, just as prophesied by Nathan. Look at verse 15 says, uh, so Nathan went to his house. Then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David, so that he was very sick. David therefore inquired of God for the child, and David fasted and went and lay all night on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him in order to raise him up from the ground, but he was unwilling, could not eat food with them. I can't imagine what was going on in his mind. Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died. That the child died. But the effects of David's sin continued on. For you see in chapter 13, David's son Tamar, or David's daughter Tamar, was raped by his son Amnon. Look at chapter 13 and verse 11. Amnon coaxes Tamar to the bedroom under a false pretense. Verse 11, chapter 13, When she brought him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come, lie with me. 
my sister. But she answered him, No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. Verse 14, however, he would not listen to her. Since, she was stronger, since he was stronger than she, he violated her and lay with her. So we see David's daughter is raped by his son. The effects of David's sin continue. Then we see Amnon was murdered in revenge by Tamar's brother, his half-brother, Absalom. Look at chapter 13, verse 20. Absalom, her brother, said to her, Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? Now keep silent, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this matter to heart. Don't worry. I'm going to take care of this. And two years later, we see the uh, note, two years in verse 23. Two years later, it happens. Take a look at uh, verse 28. After uh, Absalom entertains Amnon in a kind of a drunken feast, Verse 28, Absalom commanded his servants, saying, See now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, strike Amnon and put him to death. And so we see that's exactly what happened. The servants, verse 29, of Absalom did to Amnon just as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's son arose, and each mounted his mule and fled. Now it was while they were on the way, the report came to David. Verse 31, when he heard the report, the king arose, tore his clothes, lay on the ground, and all his servants were standing by with their clothes torn. I'm certain David was remembering his own sin. I'm certain he was remembering what Nathan the prophet had said. He said, the effects of my sin continue. Continue in his life. And they do. You know the story of Absalom. He became openly rebellious. Absalom did. And uh, we see him lipping off to Joab. Angry and defiant behavior. It starts with this rebellious attitude. The way he talks to Joab in uh, chapter 14, verses 25 through 32. He lips off to Joab like a rebellious kid. And then through sin, uh, deceitful, sinful manipulation, he betrayed David's leadership. Chapter 15. Let's take a look at verse 2. Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. And when any man had a suit to come to the king for judgment, Absalom would call him and say, "From Where are you from? What, what city are you from? And he'd say, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right, but no man listens to you on the part of the king. <laughs> but I'll listen to you. I'll listen to you. And uh, he starts to betray David's leadership. And it says, uh, verse 6, In this manner, Absalom dealt with all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole away the hearts of the men of Israel. So now it's not just lipping off. Now he's involved in betrayal. And it's, it's kind of behavior that is, is grievous. The effects of David's sin continue. Look at uh, the next step. Absalom deposes his father under the threat of personal violence. Look at uh, verses uh, 13, 14. A messenger came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, let us flee, for otherwise none of us will escape from Absalom. Go in haste, or he will overtake us quickly and bring down calamity on us. Strike the city with the edge of the sword. Now David's son is issuing threats to the father, saying, I'm going to kill you, Dad. I'm coming after you. I'm going to kill you. I can't imagine that. I have two adult sons of my own. I can't imagine that kind of betrayal. I'm killing you. And he was making good on the threat. So much, they actually had to leave. And take a look in uh, verse 16. So the king went out, all his household with him. Drop down to verse 23. It says, while all the country was weeping with a loud voice, 
all the people passed over. The king also passed over the brook Kidron. And all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. They're escaping. They're fleeing. Look at verse 30. David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up. His head was covered. He walked barefoot. All the people who were with him each covered his head and went up weeping as they went. David is weeping. He's sobbing. The effects of my sin continue. They continue. And they do. Because now, outright civil war breaks out. Those people who support Absalom fighting those people who support David. Turn to chapter 18. Chapter 18. Verse 6. Then the people went out into the field against Israel and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. The people of Israel were defeated there before the servants of David and the slaughter there that day was great. 20,000 men died. For the battle there was spread over the whole countryside and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. Now Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule. The mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. His head caught fast in the oak so he is left hanging between heaven and earth while the mule that was under him kept going. When a certain man saw it, he told Joab, said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. Joab said, Well, did you kill him? No, I didn't. And so Joab, verse 14, says, I'm not wasting time here with you. So he took three spears in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while Absalom was still alive in the midst of the oak. And ten young men who carried Joab's armor gathered around him and struck Absalom and killed him. So they just didn't thrust him through three times. They just are like mutilating his body. There's ten of them there. And then uh, Absalom killed during that great civil war. And uh, David sin. The effects continue on. When David gets the word, But the son who said, Dad, I'm going to kill you. The son's dead. Take a look at verse 32. The king said to the Cushite, who's bringing a report back from the battle, Is it well with young man Absalom? My son, how is he? The Cushite answered, Let the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up against you for evil be as that young man. Very delicate, nuanced response saying he's... He's dead. The king deeply moved, went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he walked, he wailed out, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would I have died instead of you? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Heartache for David and his family. Well, David in Psalms 32, 38, and 51, describe the effects on himself. And not just on family and all around him, but uh, uh, we're going to look at, uh, just take a look at Psalm 38 and 51. So uh, you want to mark with a piece of paper or something uh, here in 2 Samuel because we're coming back. But turn to Psalm 38 and then Also Psalm 51. We're going to be flipping back and forth. Because David suffered the direct crushing weight of the heavy discipline of God. And this, I believe, was the worst, at least for him, as he was going through it. Psalm 38, verses 1 and 2. O Lord, rebuke me not in your wrath, and chasten me not in your burning anger. For your arrows have sunk deep into me, and your hand has pressed down on me. Hold your finger there and flip to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse 1. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you're justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. God's discipline was heavy because David's sin was ultimately against the Lord. Turn back to Psalm 38, 
Take a look at the intense regret and shame and conviction. Psalm 38, verse 2. Your arrows have sunk deep down in me. Your hand is pressed down on me. Look at verse 8. I'm benumbed and badly crushed. I groan because of the agitation of my heart. Lord, all my desires before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs. My strength fails me. In the light of my eyes, even that has gone from me. Turn to Psalm 51. Verse 3, I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Intense regret, shame, and conviction. Turn back to Psalm 38. General sense kind of descriptions of uh, uh, the general sense of sorrow. Not uh, simply uh, regret and sorrow over sin, but just the heaviness and sadness of life. Psalm 38. Verse 6, I am bent over and greatly bowed down. I go mourning all day long. Look at verse 17. It says, For I am already, I'm ready to fall, and my sorrow is continually before me. Turn to Psalm 51. Verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. He lost that. It was gone. The effects of his sin continued. Look back at chapter uh, Psalm 38. Look at the physical ailments that David suffered. Physical ailment. 38 verse 3, There's no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There's no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities are gone over my head as a heavy burden. They weigh too much for me. My wounds grow foul and fester because of my folly. Take a look at chapter, uh, or later in the chapter, verse 7. My loins are filled with burning, no soundness in my flesh. You see, David suffering physically. The effects of his sin continue. But the thing that, that is striking to me, turn to uh, chapter uh, 51, Psalm 51. Psalm 51. David walked through at least nine months of phony, hypocritical, fake spiritual leadership. How do I know that? Well, he commits his adultery with Bathsheba. There's a baby born and the baby dies. And at that time, after the baby is born, David is rebuked and David confesses his sin. So there's at least nine months of this sham, fake, phony kind of spiritual leadership. Look at Psalm 51, verse 6. David looking back and then he writes, Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being. In the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Look at verse 16. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Turn to Psalm 32. Psalm 32 this so is the one time we'll be looking at that of the penitential psalm. Psalm 32 and verse 9. Do not be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Don't be like that. David's saying, that's what I was like. Don't be like that. Don't be like that. And it's, it's such a profound thing. As you think about this, this Hebrew word used in Psalm 32, verse 2, how blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. It's the Hebrew word avon. Avon means, uh, has, has a, a, a number of different meanings, but the idea behind it is twist. Twisted. You see, the effect of sin twists you. David, who was this great king, indulges his sexual gratification, covers up, kills, and goes nine months. What's going on? The twisting, the perverting of David's own life and soul. As he's unrepentant and the effect of sin is corrupting. Sin changes people. People who were here and they're no longer in the ministry, you can uh, 
You can go on Facebook of some of their accounts and say, what happened to him? What's going on in his life? It's the twisting of sin. As sin corrupts us and twists us. We see the same word used in verse 5 right at the end. I acknowledge my sin to you, my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. You forgave the guilt of my twisted sin. Staggering to see the effects of sin. of David's sin on himself. Turn over. And we'll just kind of go through. Look at all of these people. Look at the back page. There's 23. 23 things I identified. First off, David's household servants were ordered to participate in David's sinful act with Bathsheba. David said to his servants, go get that woman. She's taking a bath. Bring her back to me. I want to have sex with her up here in the royal palace. The servants had to participate in this. And then, se- then secondly, Bathsheba was sexually violated and impregnated. And third, Joab was ordered to participate in the sinful action against Uriah. Joab is commanded by David, I want that man dead. Here's how we're going to do it. You do it. Carry it out. Joab says, yes, sir. He's carrying out the David's sinful uh, manipulative cover-up. Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, was betrayed by David. If you go to chapter 23 of 2 Samuel, you see in verse 39, Uriah is listed as one of the mighty men of David. One of his trusted soldiers. That one. He stole, David stole that one's wife while he was out battling and warring. So Uriah was betrayed, but not just betrayed, but he was ultimately killed because of David's sin. Fifth, in that same foolish military deployment back in uh, 2 Samuel 11, just take a look at that. 2 Samuel 11. And uh, turn with me back there and you'll see in uh, verse 17. 2 Samuel 11, verse 17, says this, The men of the city went out, fought against Joab. Some of the people among David's servants fell, and Uriah the Hittite also died. Those other people, collateral damage. There they are. They die because of David's sin. Had nothing to do with any of this. Number six, those families of the soldiers, they get word their son, their husband, their grandson died there at that gate in that deployment. And their lives tragically changed as they grieve. And number seven, no doubt Uriah's family grieved when they were, received word of his death, just as Bathsheba did. Look at chapter 11, verse 26. Now when the wife of Uriah heard Uriah, her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. So she's grieving. She's mourning. All of these people, their lives are being affected because of David's sin. And then we see in number 8, back in uh, chapter 11, it says in uh, verse number 3 that uh, Uriah or Bathsheba is the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So Bathsheba's father was Eliam. He was betrayed. He was listed also as one of David's mighty men in chapter 23, verse 34. You can look it up and see there's his name listed. One of David's mighty men along with Uriah. The one that, that really gets to me is Ahithophel. Ahithophel. Bathsheba's grandfather was Ahithophel. Ahithophel was one of David's trusted counselors. In fact, it says in uh, uh, chapter 16, verse 23, that Ahithophel's counsel was, was like as the oracle of God. And Ahithophel was a trusted counselor of David. Bathsheba was his granddaughter. So after Bathsheba was impregnated by David, and David saw that Uriah was killed, and his betrayal was so significant, Ahithophel became a bitter man. And when Absalom's rebellion came about against David, Ahithophel joined the rebellion. In fact, turn to chapter 17. Chapter 17. Look at the counsel that Ahithophel gives to Absalom. Chapter 17, verse 1. 
Furthermore, Ahithophel said to Absalom, Please let me choose 12,000 men that I may arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and exhausted and terrify him so all the people who are with him will flee. Then I will strike down the king alone. I'm going to kill him. That's what Ahithophel says. This grandfather. Well, it didn't work out for Ahithophel. That didn't happen. In fact, the way it happens... Look at uh, verse 23. When everything is found out, verse 23, chapter 17, when Ahithophel saw his counsel was not followed, he realized it's over for me. He saddled his donkey, arose, went to his house, to his city, set his house in order, and strangled himself. Thus he died, was buried in the grave of his father. Ahithophel kills himself. The effect of David's sin. Now, Ahithophel has culpability too, that bitter spirit. But I really grieve for these men that I know who've been wronged. Their daughters have been wronged. Their granddaughters have been wronged. I, I just grieve over this. We see Ahithophel. Number 10, I, I think about Nathan. Had to deliver that message of harsh, harsh rebuke. I started talking about how it affected David. Well, what if you were Nathan? You had to go and confront the king. That's difficult. And then number 11, you know the infant son died. And then Amnon failed to control his sexual lusts. He acted manipulatively, just like his father David. And then Tamar was raped by her lustful brother, just as David forced himself upon Bathsheba. Amnon was murdered by his brother. Number 15, Absalom became a murderer and a ranger of murder, just like his father David. Absalom led a rebellion against his father David and ultimately was killed. You see, remember what I said in that rebuke that uh, Nathan gave back in chapter 12? And uh, when it says in verse 6, he must make restitution for the lamb fourfold. Fourfold. You see, there were four deaths of David's sons. The baby, infant, Bathsheba's first son, Amnon, Absalom, and then in 1 Kings 2, Adonijah. Four, fourfold. uh, Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son. Just tragic. Well, in chapter uh, 15, take a look at verses 17 through 18. Chapter 15. Verse 17, the king went out and all the people with him and they stopped at the last house. As they're leaving now, they're fleeing. All his servants passed on beside him, all the Cherethites and all the Pelethites and all the Gittites, 600 men. 600 men, 600 families. (laughs) They're fleeing. So now we've got 600 men and families fleeing from Jerusalem with David out to the wilderness. And then Ittai, The man who arrived just the day before, he left. You see that in verses 19 through 22. He left. He found out David's leaving. I came to stay with you. Now now I got to go. He goes out in the wilderness with David and his Ittai, his household, his servants. Then Hushai, David's friend, was placed in a terrible position and situation of defending David and doing some more manipulating type of things. Hushai placed in that spot. And then in verse uh, number 20, in chapter 17, Jonathan and Ahib Mahaz were placed in grave danger. They were placed in this grave danger, those two men. And it was terrible for them. They're covering up for David. They're, they're involved in all this intrigue. And then the unnamed man and his wife in Baharim, they were placed in grave danger. And then Shobi, Makir, and Bajdalai, they're placed in grave danger. But the one, I already read it. Staggering to think about. Civil war came about because of David's sin. 20,000 men died. 20,000 men died. 20,000 men died in the civil war. And seeds were sown for perpetual civil war into the future between the northern ten tribes and the southern two tribes. All of the above tragic results came about because of David's sexual sin. And Nathan said, 
in chapter 12, verse 14. By this deed, you have given great occasion for the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The tragic results upon David, upon his children, upon his closest friends, upon his casual associates, upon total strangers, upon 600 families, upon 20,000 men who die. It's staggering to see this. So, I have here on the bottom of the backside, Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Don't be deceived. Build into your lives safeguards so that you don't even go down that road. I've asked my wife to be my accountability partner with Covenant Eyes. So she sees reports of everywhere I go on the internet. And I told her, I said, I want you to come. She feels very awkward. She doesn't necessarily like doing this, but I tell her, I want you to come. I want you every week to come with that report in, in a hard copy. You bring that report to me and we'll talk about it everywhere I've gone on the internet. And then I'm going to write on it. No porn less. And I'll date it with my wife right there. That's a little awkward for me too to be talking that way. But I want to be totally open and honest with her. You need to have some kind of safeguard like that in your own life. If you want to think about this more, possibly my favorite sermon, chapter, writing, article, anything that Dr. MacArthur ever has written is found in this book. It's from his earlier book, uh, Vanishing Conscience. It's called Hacking Agag to Pieces. <laughs> Hacking Agag to Pieces. Saying that uh, there can be no easy way about coddling our sin. And it's talking about mortifying the flesh and the folly of partial obedience and life in the Spirit. So just grab this, this book. I know you know what it looks like. Truth Matters. Hacking Agag to pieces. And, 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 and look at that. It says in Galatians 5, 16 and 17, I say, walk by the Spirit. You will not carry out the desires of lusts of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. Then guard your heart. Guard your heart with all diligence. For from it flow the springs of life. As I bring this to a close, I think about that old Steve Green song, Guard Your Heart. It's a great song. If you don't know it, if you haven't heard it, it goes something like this. What appears to be a harmless glance can turn to romance and homes are divided. Feelings that should never have been awaken within, tearing the heart in two. Listen, I beg of you, guard your heart, guard your heart. Don't trade it for treasure, don't give it away. Guard your heart, guard your heart. As a payment for pleasure, it's a high price to pay for a soul that remains sincere with a conscience clear. Guard your heart. The human heart is easily swayed and often betrayed at the hands of emotion. We dare not leave the outcome to chance, we must choose in advance or live with the agony, such needless tragedy. Guard your heart, guard your heart. Don't trade it for treasure, don't give it away. Guard your heart, guard your heart. As a payment for pleasure, it's a high price to pay 
for a soul that remains sincere with a conscience clear. Guard your heart. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we're so weak. We're so prone to our giving into our flesh. Such tragedy when we do, affecting so many people around us. Oh, dear God, I pray you will help each one of these men to guard their hearts and never forget the day they studied David's sin and all the effects of his sin. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.